Good morning, everybody. If you'd like to turn to Romans chapter 12, I'm going to start there. This morning, I'd like to talk to you about buying the farm, about commitment, about complete commitment to Jesus. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, Paul talks about a kind of sacrifice. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. The King James translation says, I beseech you, I beg you, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice. You know, to give any kind of sacrifice always requires commitment. That's pretty much the definition of sacrifice. But this sacrifice is a special kind. This is your whole body. And it's not a burnt sacrifice, not a burnt offering, but a living, breathing, working body. It's the greatest form of sacrifice because really, that's all that we have here on the earth. It's all that we are. He says we're to give all of ourselves for this. Have you guys ever heard this phrase? I almost bought the farm. Abby hadn't heard of it, so I suppose it's from the younger generation, older generation, rather. When I was a kid, we used to use it when, uh, whenever we had just survived some risky endeavor, like trying to jump over something with our bike or something. It's like, I almost bought the farm on that one. I never understood where that came from, and I was really confused. I, I really was hoping I could figure that out with the magic of the internet. But I went to explore it, and I have to say it's kind of disappointing. It is, it is confusing. It, it has something to do with the Air Force and possibly taxes or inheritance. or uh, Basically, we know what it means, though. It means to buy the farm is to die trying to accomplish something. To, to pay the last full measure of something, to use Lincoln's words, for a purpose. When, a, when an Air Force pilot would fly a mission and not return, they would say that he bought the farm, trying to perform that. For this lesson, I want to apply that to our commitment to Jesus. He wants us to buy the farm for him. And is that really so much of a stretch? Because in Colossians chapter 3, starting with verse 2, Paul says, Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Jesus wants us to buy the farm, to fully commit ourselves to him. So this part of the lesson is for you people who are on the edge, who have never committed yourselves. If that's you, then, then listen carefully to this part. Uh, one time in Luke chapter 18, a uh, rich or just a young ruler, came and asked Jesus an important question. Starting in verse 18, he said, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Do you know the commandments? You do know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, All these I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. When I read this for this lesson, I saw something I hadn't really seen in this before. This ruler was a faithful Jew. He had been raised as a Jew, and was obeying God all the way through that. He's basically an analog to people who've been raised in the church, people who live according to 
God's will because they've been raised that way. And you notice what he didn't say. He didn't say, oh, you've obeyed the commandments, so you're good. He also didn't say, sell half your stuff and hang out with me on the weekends. He said, give everything and come and follow me. He really wanted this young man to to buy the farm, to fully commit himself instead of just dipping his toe. Because even though he was an obedient follower of the law, what Jesus knew is that he hadn't given himself. He really was just performing, going through the motions. He hadn't committed. And what Jesus asked him to do was sell all his stuff, but also to, to fully commit to follow him. And he was not willing to do that. In contrast, when Paul was talking to the Corinthians, in Corinthians chapter 8, he told them about the Macedonians, and he was really excited about them because they did give themselves to God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, starting at verse 1, he says, We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy, their ex- and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. These people... They did give monetarily. They were engaged in the work. But Paul was most excited that they had given themselves to God first, that they had committed everything to be his followers. I went to college for a long time, and I really enjoyed it. But what I didn't enjoy was homework. And I found out this amazing thing. You can audit classes in college. You can actually go to a class And you can learn everything there is to learn, but you don't get graded on it. You just have to pay for it. I thought, this could be perfect for me. But what do you think would have happened to me had I audited all my classes? What about when that test came? Would I have really studied for that test? Would I have worked hard for it when it didn't even really matter? What about when I was tired in the morning and I didn't feel like going to class? Would I really have just pushed at extra to go to the class? that I wasn't even being graded on. The truth of the matter is, if I had audited classes, I never would have gotten my degree. And I wouldn't even have taken them seriously. If I hadn't put myself into it, if I hadn't taken the risk and fully committed myself to the chance of failing and the opportunity to succeed. Jesus wants us not to audit Christianity. The way he feels, he spoke about the Laodiceans in Revelation chapter 3 because they lived that kind of life. In Revelation chapter 3, he said, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Jesus is disgusted with fence sitters. He's disgusted with people who won't commit. In fact, he just wanted them to commit to something, anything. In fact, right after this, he says what they really need to commit to. He says, For you say, I am rich, and I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to annoy your eyes so that you may see. They needed to fully commit. They needed to commit and buy things that mattered. Gold, clothes, salve for their eyes, things that were enduring and not holding back as they had been. Jesus wants more than that from us. Jesus is disgusted, what we found in this passage is, he's disgusted by people who will not commit, who will just stay withdrawn, dipping their toe into Christianity. 
Jesus didn't just die so that we could feel better about ourselves, so that we could feel like, I'm a pretty good person. He wants more than just simple obedience. The rich young ruler had that. He had been going through the motions through his entire life, and that wasn't enough. Jesus wants your whole heart. He wants you to buy the farm and not stand on the sidelines anymore. At this point in the lesson, I'm going to spend a few moments talking about those people who were once committed, people who once gave everything to God but backed off. You know these people? Abraham. One time, he left his family, he left the place that he was comfortable with, and he went to a place that God was going to tell him later on. He didn't even know where he was going. He committed his life to that path. He was even willing to sacrifice his son later on to follow God. But then came the time when he faced Abimelech, and he was afraid that he was going to be killed. Then he pulled back, and he didn't trust in God during that time and lied about his wife. He did that twice. And then there was the time when God said, I'm going to give you a son. And it was getting, they were getting on in years, and he pulled back. And he said, I'll work on my own plan with Sarah and Hagar, and I think I can make this happen. What about Moses? Moses was completely committed to saving the Israelites. He even killed an Egyptian to save an Israelite who was being beaten up. But when they were afraid, they became afraid of him, he ran and hid in the wilderness, basically. Then God came and asked him and said, I'm ready to lead out my people, and I want you to do that for me. And Moses said, I'm not the right person. I don't think I want to do this. I, I'm not capable. I don't think you know what I'm capable of, God. And he pulled back and wouldn't follow through. And what about Peter? Peter had given up everything, his entire lifestyle, everything that he had in order to follow Jesus. And he was willing to live and to die for Jesus. But then Jesus was arrested. Peter followed him and felt fear for his own life in the courtyard while he was watching. And then he denied Jesus. He completely backed off and, and pulled out. What about me? Have I been committed once and pulled back? Sometimes we want to take back what we've invested in God. When we once went all in and, and gave everything for him, sometimes we want to pull that back. Maybe we want to invest in something else. Maybe to diversify so that we don't have all our eggs in one basket, to use financial terms. Sometimes it might be for safety, for feelings that Maybe I'm not sure that God will be able to bring me through all this, and I need to, to divide myself to make sure that I feel safe. Sometimes it might be for temptation, that some things look really good here on this earth, really attractive, and I want to take part of myself and, and enjoy those and devote just part of myself to God and part of myself to the pleasures of the earth. Or maybe it can be for wavering faith, for a an unsurety that, that God is real, that this investment is really worth it. There are a lot of different reasons why we can back off from our initial commitment. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus tells us, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. We can't serve two masters. We can't diversify our investment in God. Because when we do that, we make God our enemy. Because he wants us to be fully invested in him. And when we look at ourselves and we see this in our lives, that we've pulled back, sometimes it makes us question our original commitment even. Sometimes people feel like they want to be baptized again. I don't see any scripture for that necessarily, but I do understand it. I, just, I understand the want to 
go back and recommit everything to God. But no matter what it is we do when we try to address this, we have to do what Jesus wants us to do, not just salve our conscience or make ourselves feel comfortable, but we really need to do what Jesus wanted. He wants us to buy the farm, to do it in our lives completely, to give ourselves truly to him. So, so what does that look like in action? How does that full commitment manifest itself practically in our lives? Well, in Luke chapter 9, if you'd like to turn there, several people came to Jesus saying they wanted to commit themselves to him, and he answered them in a lot of different ways. And we can learn a lot from the way that Jesus answered. Starting in verse 57, it goes like this. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds have air, the birds of the air have their nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another, he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. What we can see from these passages and other ones that we've read is that we can't hold back. What it looks like to commit fully to God is to practically stop doing some things that just are wastes of time things and resources. We're going to devote our bodies to his priorities instead of to our own priorities. And that's a daily choice of what we think and how we act and what we do in our lives. When we hold something back, it's not fair to God. It's not what he wants. He wants us to fully commit. We can't diversify. We can't try to hedge our bets. We have to recognize that there is a risk. It is risky. We have giving all of ourselves as a sacrifice to Jesus. That's putting all our eggs in one basket. We need to recognize that risk, and he wants us to count that cost. Like he told the man about not having a place to lay his head. He wants us to understand what that cost is, understand that risk, and fully pay it. He wants us not to wait, not to delay or procrastinate or play it safe. Because in this case, playing it safe and not fully investing is the riskiest thing you can possibly do. That is when you're in danger, when you haven't given yourself to God. And we can't wait for things to be just right. We learned that in Ecclesiastes, too, that if you wait, if you're watching the clouds, you're never going to plant. If you wait for just the right time, Satan is going to make sure that something is always just not quite right. That the time is not right. That maybe you'd like your aunt to, be, to see you get baptized, but she's not in town yet, so maybe wait another week. Or something is going on, things aren't quite right. We need to learn not to wait because things are never going to be perfect. We need to begin this process and commit ourselves or rededicate ourselves because no matter what's going on in our lives, there's never going to be room made for it. There's been countless stories of people who say, uh, when I finally uh, retire, uh, then I'll be able to study the Bible like I want to or talk to the people like I want to. The thing is, when you retire, most of the people that I know kind of tend to be more busy than they were when they didn't retire. It's just a dream to imagine that things are going to work out. You have to make the time and commit now. We need to give our all. That means doing your best for him, not just stopping some of the things that we've done before and focusing on the good, but but actively beginning things, new things, and giving our all, committing ourselves to, to try as hard as we can to get those things done. Not to look back as the as the person in his example who puts his hand to the plow. 
This one may be the most abstract one, but probably means the most to me. But we need to value what it is we're buying. We need to understand that we can't buy the kingdom of heaven with anything that we have. Jesus even said, what would a man give in exchange for his own soul? Or what good would it do if he gained the whole world but lost his own soul? We have nothing that we could give for it, but when we want to receive, when we want to save our soul, we would be willing to give anything, and it would be worthless. Long-term investment, the investment in eternity, is worth more than making a quick buck, than, than having enjoyment here on the earth that leads us away from that path. And when we live that way, when we truly live like, the, like Jesus is important to us, other people see that. It makes a difference. They see that we're making decisions for things that they don't even believe in or believe are important, but that guides our lives. That helps show people how important it is and how good it is to give their lives to Jesus. Now, can you imagine a street person who has all of their worldly possessions in a shopping cart that they're pushing along? Now imagine somebody comes and gives them a new car and a new house and enough money to live the rest of their lives in comfort. Can you imagine that person just taking their shopping cart and not to try to pay for it, but just out of joy, just giving it to the to the person, to their benefactor who gave them all those things. Because when they look at what used to be all of their life's possessions, they look like garbage compared to what they have received. That's what Paul thought when he looked back at his life before he became a Christian. He said, everything that I consider to be gain before is like rubbish for what I gain through Jesus Christ. Somehow for me it seems so much easier to see that when I imagine someone's, all their possessions piled in a cart. But as far as it goes for everything I have, my house, my car, my, all my savings, all the things that I own here on the earth, they might as well be in a shopping cart for all that they're worth in, in buying our salvation. Just somehow I fool myself into thinking they're more valuable than I look at somebody else's. But we need to have that perspective and value what it is we're giving far more than what it is we're paying because the, the comparison is, is irrelevant. And we need to renew our commitment regularly because it's in our nature to cool off, to back off. We need to build our confidence and our faith in the certainty of our eternal reward, in the certainty of God and his ability to bring us there. If we don't renew that, then we are going to drift away from it. Now you have Peter. When Jesus came walking to him across the water, he got out of the boat and walked towards him with no railings. That's a person who's thoroughly committed. Later on, after the resurrection, Jesus... Peter knew that Jesus was on the shore when he was in the fishing boat. And he just jumped in the water and swam for shore. What's really neat about that for me is one of those instances was before the resurrection, before the, the crucifixion, and the other one was after. And you know what that means? Even if we make a mistake, even if we turn away or we, we take back our investment, we can find a way back. Every one of those people that I mentioned as examples of people who were once committed, Abraham, Moses, Peter, every one of them was able to return to God and to be used to accomplish some great spiritual work. And that includes me. We're all able to come back from that as long as we're alive. What about the disciples who became apostles? They left everything to follow him. But certainly the ultimate example is Jesus himself. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 and onward, are the parables that I sort of started this lesson under. They have things to say for us, but after studying them more and looking at other commentaries, 
I think they have more to tell us about Jesus than they have to tell us about ourselves. Starting in verse 44, Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has, and he buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. This tells us more about Jesus because we have nothing with which to buy the kingdom of heaven with, but he did. He gave his place in heaven. He gave his life. He gave his flesh and his blood to pay a debt that wasn't his, but mine and yours. Can we really do any less in the face of that? He really bought the farm for us as an example. Now, if there's one thing I want you to get out of this lesson today, I hope you got it. Must have had five slides that said, <laughs> buy the farm. But this doesn't mean anything unless we do something with that today. What will you do with it? If you are a Christian and you find yourself diversifying, drifting off, cooling off, slipping away, now is the time to take a hard and honest look at your life and renew your commitment today. Jesus wants you to buy the farm. Do you really want to do anything less than that? Knowing what his plans are for you? Are you a person who hasn't obeyed Jesus' calling? Now I'm talking to you. If you're sitting on the fence, uncommitted, you've just been along for the ride, and you've never invested yourself fully in Jesus. Don't wait anymore. This is a limited time offer. Start today and start buying something that's truly worthwhile instead of the things that perish here on this earth. This is a lesson that every single one of us here can respond to today. There's not a person in this audience that can't act on this. Let's every one of us pledge to ourselves, to each other, and to Jesus that we are going to buy the farm, that, that we are going to make that change in our lives starting now, starting today. Now is not the time to wait, but the time to act. And if there's anything we can do to help you be baptized or or help you in any way to straighten out your life and commit yourself to Jesus, then come forward now as we stand and sing this invitation song.